An open letter to Nathan Oakley from Charles Breeling, also known as Flat Earth Map. Dear Nathan Oakley, thank you again for coming on my Flat Earth Civil Discourse show recently. I'm sorry that the encounter wasn't an entirely productive one, although it seems that it spawned quite a few videos on your channels, so I'm glad you're getting some mileage out of it. It appears there are a number of misunderstandings you have about my position and my methods. I have never lied to you or anyone else in the Flat Earth debate since I entered the arena almost 14 years ago. Personal integrity is important to me, so I am simply truthful in all my dealings. It simply makes things a lot easier. I'd be honest, Nathan, it was tempting to give you the Dr. Zack treatment or crush you into a fine powder like I did with quantum erasers, endless math and physics errors. And a few of my supporters wanted me to do the same. But instead, I'll address your claims and try to clear up misunderstandings. This one is a bit more serious, so I'll try to avoid punching down, as I'll get into at the very end of this video. Our history. Let's start back at the beginning. My understanding is that the flat earth concept first crossed your path when you were taking many airplane flights as an international sales rep. Anyone looking at the wide open ocean from cruising altitude will see the sea is looking flat, flat, flat. After a bit of investigation, you concluded that the earth itself is flat. While many globe earth folks believe that you know the earth is a globe and are just in this arena for money, I'm convinced that you believe that the earth is in fact flat. I don't think you would have interviewed with Vice Media with their 10 million subscribers if you thought otherwise. Nathan, I remember when you used to shoot videos facing a digital projector, and occasionally you'd publish fun informal moments with your family, and I'd leave comments like this one from five years ago. Do you remember how the lack of a flat earth map troubled many flat earth folks back then? As I recall, Antonio Subarats, Patricia Steer, and the rest of the potato potato crew made a concerted effort to gather data from around the world in one massive 24-hour information gathering spree on the September 2016 equinox. I left supportive comments like this one when you were in the planning stages. The plan, as I understood Antonio explaining it, was that by analyzing the sun angles at solar noon with azimuths and times of sunrises and sunsets, that the contents or the continents could be accurately placed on a flat earth map. You had one rule for participants, point their camera at the sun. Do you remember that I contributed to your 24 hour equinox sun observation and you and the crew were all smiles. I joined the live stream and narrated as I showed you the sundial on which I'd been marking shadows all morning and took notice of the perfectly straight path of marks. And, and at the moment of solar noon, I took a live reading of the angle of elevation of the sun using a handmade solar clinometer. Since I faced a courtyard, there was no horizon sighting possible. I then walked back to my cubicle and gave you my readings. Let's listen in to just one minute of the live stream. If you do 90 minus the protractor, you get the angle of elevation. So the sun's elevation here in Philadelphia is 50 degrees at solar noon on the equinox. Great, I'm just making a note of that now. Awesome, absolutely awesome. That was a brilliant demonstration. Can you do one last thing for us? Sure. Just point your camera at the sun. Oh, that, that's that's part of the, that's one of the regulations, right? That's, <laughs> yeah. one, of the, that's one of the rules, right? Oh, so, always good to see it. <laughs> can, can you see yeah, that? That's, that's awesome, awesome. Uh, awesome. Yeah. thank you. Thank you very much, that was brilliant. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm actually going to sign off now. I just wanted to give you my, my little piece at Solar Noon. Uh, I hope you guys have a great uh, rest of this project. Charles, can you do one more thing? Oh, sure. Can you become a flat earther? Because you're really intelligent, and it would be wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> no, the thing, the thing is, you guys are the sweetest, dearest people, and I really enjoy interacting with, with you folks. Um, so it's, it's really about people. It's about people. Uh, people connecting with people. Um, so that's really my take on it. That's a good so. answer. Nathan, do you remember that it was in that conversation that Antonio offered to debate me, and we agreed very amicably? Less than one month later, you personally moderated Antonio's and my debate on the shape of the earth. Don't you remember when people could disagree about the shape of the earth and still be friends? 
But at some point, your devotion to Flat Earth caused you to rethink how you view Globers. I think this is part of the problem with our relationship, in that you're convinced that the Earth is flat, therefore I must be lying about the Earth being a globe. I'm sorry you've come to this conclusion. I kind of understand your position. You think someone like me, who's studied the shape of the Earth as extensively as I have, should come to the same conclusion of, as you. Because I'm on the opposite side of, as you, after thousands of hours of study and exploration, you believe I'm lying about the shape of the Earth. Again, I'm very sorry you, you've concluded this. I truly and honestly wanted to have a civil conversation with you, Nathan. But you know what they say about expectations in reality. Hope springs eternal. I wanted us to talk like two people trying to communicate through speaking and listening, not like two rams butting heads. You might be amused that some Globers consider me to be a coddler of Flat Earth folks because I invite them on my civil discourse show and I don't attempt to verbally dismantle them. Rather, I listen to them and we talk about the shape of the Earth like people. I think this approach bears more fruit than verbal gladiatorial combat, but it appears you had other plans. One verbal battering ram is to use repetitive phrases over and over with no tempt, attempt at meaningful communication. In preparation for this response to you, Nathan, I tabulated how often you used some of these words and phrases. For starters, in a mere 57-minute conversation, you accused me of assuming the Earth's sphere 66 times, which is interesting because I don't assume anything when I step outside and perform my backyard explorations any one of which you could do. Assume a sphere. My approach is, what can we learn from careful, meticulous study of the sun, moon, and stars? It's fun to use logic and reasoning to try to figure out what Mother Nature her herself is telling us. My entire channel is dedicated to helping other folks get outside and make measurements. I'm not sure if you've noticed this, but unlike most other Globers in this arena, my channel doesn't try to convince people that the Earth is a globe. Here's what I know, Nathan. Horizons at the beach appear to be ruler straight. And when I take a flight over the ocean, it appears flat. And I certainly don't feel any motion of the ground beneath my feet. It appears reasonable that the Earth is flat and stationary. Yet, I learned in school that the Earth is a globe. And I know all about the space program that's been going on for decades with the resultant photographic evidence. But then when I got into the Flat Earth Globe Earth debate in 2008, I became really curious. On the one hand, my senses tell me that the Earth is flat and stationary. But on the other, I've been told by my education that the Earth is a planet. After act interacting with years, or for years, with Flat Earth folks, it appears that there are a number of interesting reasons they give for the Earth being flat. Why would I assume the Earth is a globe? It just doesn't make any sense. Nathan, I believe that you may have a skewed idea of what science is. It seems that you think science is, memorize these facts, juniors. Don't ask questions. But in reality, science is about exploration. Asking questions, designing tests, performing experiments, observing and measuring things in nature. While I am not a scientist by profession, I have taught physical science, high school chemistry, biology, and I try to think like a scientist. I could not have designed, myself, no one helped me, all the backyard explorations all over my channel if I simply assumed the Earth was a sphere. It's important that you understand this sequence. Step one, determine the shape of the Earth. Step two, find its size. A great deal of mere misunderstanding of my position requires that we both jump into step two after making an assumption in lieu of performing step one. No, assumption is not the first step. The irony here, Nathan, is that you assume the earth is flat for the very reasons I mentioned. But then you layer on top of that misunderstandings about math and physics. Part of the problem is that you hang out with quantum eraser who literally can't even subtract without a calculator. Do you remember when he subtracted two positive numbers and ended up with a larger number? Blue Marble Science did a video on this, and then I had a lot of fun taking 97 minutes to detail his math and physics blunders. Like when he was baffled that 10 to the negative 17 could be close to zero. And just last week, he started screaming profanities at a guest on your show when the guest said that you can use trigonometry without a triangle. 
screaming. It appears that all he knows about this fascinating field of math is the first and most simplistic definition in a children's dictionary. The branch of mathematics concerned with the relationship between sides and angles of right triangles. I told my wife this, and she said when she was in high school, she loved trigonometry and how boring it would have been if all they did was measure triangles. So no, I don't assume the Earth is a globe, but you, Nathan, do assume the Earth is flat, just like Quantum Eraser assumes trigonometry requires triangles. Logical Fallacies Speaking of fallacious reasoning, Nathan, you repeatedly accused me of using several logical fallacies. By my count, 108 times. Frequently, these accusations came in the form of serial interruptions. I'd say, if the Earth were a globe, or if it's flat, or if it's a rhombic de decahedron or some other shape. Amazing. Begging the question, false dichotomy, non sequitur. Three accusations of logical fallacies, and I haven't even finished the sentence yet. Let's take each of these fallacies in turn. Begging the question. This is a form of circular argument where you assume the thing you're trying to prove. You accuse me of begging the question because you say I assume the Earth's a sphere and then use this knowledge to prove the Earth's a sphere. Nathan, I've tried to tell you over and over and over again, I don't assume the Earth's a sphere. I've actually gone out and done the legwork, working through a ton of explorations out in the field, and I've verified that the Earth is in fact a globe, starting with zero assumptions. You could do the same if you attempted the explorations on my channel. Now that I've done this exhaustive fieldwork, I can safely say I know for a fact that the Earth is a globe. I have successfully completed step one. Since I'm not assuming the Earth is a sphere, then I can't be begging the question now, can I? In our one-hour conversation, you invoked begging the question 25 times. False dichotomy. It is not a fallacy to ask the question if the Earth is a sphere, or if the Earth were flat, or if the Earth were some other shape. It is especially not a false dichotomy, also known as a false bifurcation, or the either-or fallacy. It is also sometimes called the black or white fallacy, since you're presenting two choices as if they're the only choices. An actual example of a false dichotomy would be to say, if you oppose this social welfare spending bill, you must hate poor people. The false choice is between supporting the bill and hating poor people. Obviously, there are other options, such as opposing new government spending and or prefer, pr preferring that social welfare be handled at the local level with private charities. It is not enough to just have two choices to qualify as a false dichotomy. It is the restriction to only two choices in an unfair manner, so as to strawman the opposition. In the social welfare example, someone opposing the bill because of a desire to see local private charities handle the need wouldn't appreciate being told that he opposes the bill because he hates poor people. Repeatedly, I say, the earth could be a globe or it could be flat, and you accuse me of a false dichotomy. What exactly are you saying? The accusation of this particular logical fallacy says that you, Nathan, don't think my choice is a fair one because I'm not covering the option that you prefer. But you're a flat earther. It's in the name of your long running show, The Flat Earth Debate. I told you that there could be some truth to this false dichotomy accusation, as I told you in our civil discourse, in that I don't seriously discuss other shapes of the earth, like the hollow earth, aka concave. Although you may be interested to learn that episode 15 of my flat earth civil discourse was with a concave earth fellow named Joshua, aka Zenith Atlas. He even has a custom license plate. If anything, he would be the one to accuse me of a false dichotomy. However, Nathan, there is some irony in your accusing me of a false dichotomy. Repeatedly, you act as if there are only two choices. The Earth could be a perfect sphere, 3,959 miles in radius, with zero atmospheric refraction, or it could be flat. Thus, the black swan image of platform habitat, being that it appears not to match the geometric ideal sphere, 
is seen as a slam dunk for, fall, for flat earth. But it's a false dichotomy. There are not only two choices between flat and a perfect sphere with no refraction. How about a third choice? A planet Earth with an atmosphere and changing weather conditions that may slightly alter the refractive properties of that atmosphere from day to day. So sure, the, flame, the famous black swan image of platform habitat debunked the perfect sphere Earth with no atmosphere, but in actuality, that's a straw man choice. And furthermore, there is a nice image taken from that same location by the same photographer, which leads to some questions. Even though I am not guilty of it from a flat earth perspective, Nathan, you invoked false dichotomy 77 times. Non sequitur. While non sequitur traditionally refers to an absurdity, such as my suggesting that the shape of the earth could be a rhombic dodecahedron or a Pink Floyd crystal prism, it more formally refers to a conclusion which doesn't logically follow from the previous statements. You, you accused me of non sequiturs six separate times during our conversation. You may feel that my invoking rhombic dodecahedron is silly. My statement is not a non sequitur because I'm covering all possible shapes of the earth, sphere, flat, or some other shape. Hey, Nathan, are you ready for the irony in your invoking the non sequitur fallacy? Your beloved black swan argument, the one you've been citing for, what, two years now, is a non sequitur. Believe it or not, for two different reasons. The technical definition of a non sequitur is does not follow. So let's review the infamous black swan argument, and let's make note that in Quantum Eraser's original document, he makes specific reference to the geometric horizon. The logical structure is the modus tollens, or denying the consequent. If A leads to B, and we find B is false, then A must be false. If the Earth were a globe, and it is 3,959 3, miles in radius, then the distance in miles to the geometric horizon must be 1.22 times the square root of the observer's height in feet. A flat earth fellow will then show a picture of wackly wiggly platform habitat in front of a refracted horizon and shout, not A, the earth is flat. But there are a few problems. One is that the geometric horizon is not shown in the photo. Flat earth folks and globe earth folks agree the geometric horizon is rarely visible. All we can see is the refracted horizon. So that's black swan non sequitur number one. It does not follow that the Earth is flat, since we don't have any information about the geometric horizon from the black swan image. Therefore, we can't conclude anything about the shape or size of the Earth. The second problem is that the premise, even if we take out the word geometric, still doesn't lead to the flat Earth conclusion. The reason is that premise A is a multi-part one. If the Earth is a globe and that globe's radius is 3,959 miles. Not A simply negates one of these two parts, which is a problem for the flat earth interpretation of the famous black swan photo. It could just as easily lead to a globe earth, but with a larger radius. Non sequitur number two for the black swan. You might be interested that I made an entire video dedicated to the flat earth's black swan, Modus Tollens, back in May of 2020. It's less than 10 minutes long, Nathan, and you're welcome to leave a comment. Requiring R. Let's talk about the radius of the globe Earth, otherwise known as R. I had pinned your comment in my conversation with Chemo, where you repeated your demand that I tell you where I get my R value. This should be interesting. Nathan, you remember I used to be an occasional visitor to your Flat Earth debate show up until the point where you became obsessed with the radius of the globe Earth. Now, it's such a prominent part of your thinking that you've added it to your list of housekeeping questions that you use at the start of many of your shows. This is my interpretation, but it seems that you think globe, oh, globe folks like me get our belief in the globe from exactly one phenomenon, boats over the horizon. From that one effect, the quote-unquote fake cur curvature calculators were designed. Furthermore, the size of the fake globe Earth relies upon Eratosthenes' measurement at Alexandria, 
one summer solstice 2,200 years ago. It's nothing but a cycle of begging the question assumptions and self-justifications. I'll get into Eratosthenes a little later in this letter. But to be honest, I believe this obsession with R has gotten to you. For starters, it soured our, rela- our friendship, and it also caused you to start seeing R everywhere. Did you know that you invoked R 182 times in our 57-minute conversation? Lately, you're very fond of using the phrase, you're going to need R for that, and during our conversation, you attempted to bludgeon me with the question, where did you get your R value? At one point, you even replied to what I was saying by replying, don't care, need R. Is this an obsession, Nathan? Spheres come in all sizes, and each one has a radius. But get this, Nathan, I have little interest in the radius of the Earth. Let me repeat that. I have little interest in the radius of the earth, especially in the most important aspect of my channel, encouraging flat earth folks such as you to get outside and make careful observations of the sun, moon, and stars. I recently made a video entitled, Do I Require R? in the explorations on my channel. Since you're still accusing me of requiring R, let me explain again how my explorations don't require R. The fact of the matter is that many Flat Earth folks are fascinated with the elusive curvature and enjoy using curvature calculators, such as this one from Walter Bislin. But uh, these topics feature prominently in many Globe Earth folks' videos. While I occasionally use curve calculators to make a point, I never use them as proof of the globe. They're just another tool for the toolbox. What I try to do in my do-it-yourself exploration videos is encourage folks to get outside and study the sun, moon, and stars. I hear all the time that you can't prove the shape of the floor by looking at the shape of the ceiling, but that has never been my point. The sky is a dome, regardless of the shape of the earth. No, it is by studying the heavens that one can ascertain three crucial aspects. Are heavenly bodies, such as the sun, moon, and stars, local or distant? Is the ground we stand upon level with respect to the heavens or sloping? And is there an axial rotation associated with how we view the heavens? Here's a matrix of six explorations that you can do regarding the sun, and you can do very similar ones with the moon and stars. Nathan, please understand that you can explore these three areas of inquiry, distant heavens, sloping ground, and axial rotation, regardless of the size of the globe, which means no R is required. Recently, I heard you say that every Glober argument requires R, except for the ones that require a flat plane. It's clear you believe that we live on a flat Earth, while Globers have a made-up value for the radius of the imaginary globe. So let's just take two of my explorations and see if we could find this R you keep talking about. Let me emphasize that the phrase I repeat more than any other in all my videos is to make careful observations. If you're photographing the sun, you need a good solar filter, unlike the results from this Flat Earth video. If you have that and a decent zoom, you could photograph the sun glare-free throughout the day and observe its size. It is absolutely canonical in every Flat Earth model, regardless of the map or design, that the sun is getting closer to or further from every non-Arctic observers on Earth. So if the sun stays the same angular size throughout the day, that establishes that the sun is in fact very distant. You can repeat this process with the moon, Nathan, and no filter is required. The conclusion won't be the shape of the Earth, but it will definitely be problematic for a flat Earth with a local sun and moon. There would have to be some perfect compensating mechanism, keeping the sun and moon the exact same size as it physically got closer to or further from every observer on Earth, regardless of where in the sky the sun and moon appeared. This is the concept behind my future video series, Can Natural Distortion Produce Deceptive Perfection? I published the introduction one month ago. If the Earth were flat, we might make one prediction for the appearance of the sun, and an entirely different prediction if the Earth were a globe. We then go out into the field and make careful observations. 
if we find the observations to be a perfect match for the globe prediction, we'll have to come up with some reasons why it didn't match our flat Earth reality. The key question is, can natural distortion produce deceptive perfection? Could the natural processes of perspective and refraction cause the flat Earth sun to maintain perfectly consistent angular size in these photos exactly as predicted by the heliocentric model? I have not finished making do-it-yourself exploration videos, but going through my current crop of 20 videos, you see each helps establish the three crucial aspects to determining the shape of the Earth, distance, slope, and or axial rotation. Now this is important, Nathan. None of them, I repeat, none of them require R. The Earth could be 10 times as big as it is now, or 10 times as small. And you'd still find it useful to, find, to know if the sun, moon, and stars are distant, or if we're standing on a sloping surface with respect to the heavens, and if there's an axial rotation associated with the motion of heavenly bodies. Distant sun, moon, and stars, sloping earth, sur earth surface, and axial rotation are all indicators of a globe, with no reference to its size. No R needed. That's why I keep calling it step one establish the shape of the earth, and only then will you be able to do step two, measure its size. You keep skipping step one and then blaming me for the confusion that follows, which makes you guilty of the Dr. No fallacy, blaming others after skipping a prerequisite. Which brings us, Nathan, to Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes is famous in terms of the globe Earth and that he's the first person in history that we know of to accurately estimate the size of the planet. He was a Greek polymath, which means he knew a great deal about a great many subjects. He was a mathematician, a geographer, and an astronomer. How did he measure the Earth's size? Eratosthenes simply measured the shadow length at Alexandria on solar noon on the day of the summer solstice, the day on which he knew the, the light would reach the bottom of a well in Syene, which lay on the Tropic of Capricorn. He then solved a simple proportion using the distance from Alexandria to Syene, which was exactly two camels, according to this ancient papyrus. It is important to note that no one is citing Eratosthenes as proof of the globe. It is only after we learn the shape of the Earth that we can measure its size. Professor Gavinod writes, without an independent test of the hypothesis that the Earth is spherical, Eratosthenes is not a physical measure, but a model-dependent parameter estimation. I've been having a playful running battle with Sleeping Warrior over how did Eratosthenes know the Earth was a sphere. He even thinks I owe you an apology. In answering his question, it's important to realize where Eratosthenes fell in the timeline of knowledge of the shape of the Earth. We'll start with a Pythagorean named Philolaus, who believed that the Earth orbited a central fire, along with the sun, moon, planets, and stars. He's one of the first scholars to suge suggest a shift away from geocentrism and instead had an orbiting Earth in a pyrocentric model. Plato, who is known for his five platonic solids, taught his students that the Earth was a sphere and even suggested that if the Earth were to be viewed from a great distance, it would appear as a multicolored ball. Aristotle gave us a nice list of justifications for the spherical Earth, namely the famous ships over the horizon observation, the fact that we see further from higher altitudes, the curved shadow on the moon during lunar eclipses, and the fact that different constellations can be seen as one travels further south and Polaris appears lower in the northern sky. Archimedes, who is known for his excellent hygiene, wrote, The surface of any fluid at rest is the surface of a sphere whose center is the same as that of the earth. Which is interesting because so many flat earth folks declare the exact opposite because things look flat. Archimedes essentially described level water as a piece of a sphere. It's important to note that this applies to all bodies of water at rest, especially smaller ones, where the curvature is not noticeable to the naked eye. And then came Eratosthenes. 
Yes, he measured the shadow angle at Alexandria on the day that the sun shone to the bottom of a well in Syene. Many flat-earth folks like to seize upon this phenomenon that Eratosthenes observed as being one that could also be observed on a flat earth with a local sun. But flat earth folks neglect that he didn't only estimate the circumference of the earth, he also measured the tilt of the earth's axis with regards to our orbit around the sun. And he was the first to use the precursors to latitude and longitude, which is a non-Euclidean way of describing locations on the surface of a sphere. For these reasons and many more, he is considered to be the father of modern geography. You see, Nathan, Eratosthenes had already done step one. How do you measure the size of the earth? You must first know its shape. Step one comes before step two for a reason. One last point about the Eratosthenes method. I've tried explaining to you that this method with two locations only cannot prove the earth is a globe because you could explain the observation with a local sun and a flat earth. But if you repeat the observation with multiple locations at different latitudes, you'll quickly see the globe confirmed as there is always 60 nautical miles per degree. Lying. Nathan, did you know that one of the signs of narcissism is accusations of lying? Especially when these accusations are over the top and not grounded in reality, with no attempt to learn the truth of the situation. As I've mentioned before, you accuse me of needing to use the established radius of the globe Earth, 3959 miles, in my explorations. When I tell you the truth, that my explorations don't require any specific Earth radius, they only determine shape, you accuse me of lying. These accusations have gone so far as to trigger you when I simply use the word sphere, or atmosphere, or globe. None of these words require the Earth to be 3959 miles in radius, yet you call me a liar every time. Here's an analogy. Joe tells Reggie, I don't drive a Tesla. Later, Joe is talking with Reggie about driving his electric car, and Reggie accuses him of being a liar. Is there any way that Joe could be telling the truth? Sure, there are lots of other electric cars on the road today, not just Teslas. Did you know that in our one-hour chat, Nathan, you accused me of lying 116 times? That's a bit much, especially since they stem from your lack of understanding. You've accused me of lying countless times outside of our conversation as well. And I've never lied. You would think that you'd at least try to understand where the disconnect was, especially since frequently when I'm accused of lying, I simply challenge the accuser to name a single lie I've told. In the case of your chat stream, my side of the conversation was preserved in text. You're welcome to search all you like. As I've mentioned earlier in the section on R, knowing how often you accuse me of requiring an R value for the shape or for the size of the earth, I recorded a video where I stepped through all 20 of my backyard do-it-yourself explorations searching for R. And it turns out that I was telling the truth the whole time. The established radius of 3959 miles for the globe is not required in any of my explorations. And here's a bit of irony. I set up the video to be a YouTube premiere, which means that folks were able to know in advance about the video with its title and a screenshot. And this screenshot triggered you. Eight hours before my video went live, the video showing in detail how I don't require R, you recorded a short video <laughs> where you again accused me of requiring R. All because of the screenshot used the word hemisphere. It appears that your thinking is that the word hemisphere has the word sphere in it. And if I say sphere, what I really mean is an Earth-sized sphere with radius of 3959 miles. Exactly who's doing the assuming, Nathan? And I definitely can tell that you've been hanging out with Quantum Eraser with your Charles Lying Continues title. This would be clever if you were in middle school. Unfortunately, since you're past 40, this is just sad. Nathan, there may be p people listening who may think I'm doing a caricature of your thinking. Surely you can't be triggered by the word sphere, right? So thankfully, you left a nice comment and preserved it within your own video. In the globe model, this needs R. Um, no, it doesn't. 
Globe models come in all sizes. While the actual planet Earth has an established radius of 3959 miles, my explorations will work exactly the same if it were double that or half that. Thus, no R. Northern Hemisphere. We see that sphere bit? That requires the R you keep lying about needing. Again, nice try, but no. It appears you're grasping at straws. Northern Hemisphere is a very convenient two-word phrase referring to the land north of the equator. If you know a better way of saying it, you're welcome to invent your own phrase. But again, desktop model globes have hemispheres, and they work just like the ones on Earth, but without your precious R value. It's not very often one gets a response video made about a video that hasn't even been published yet. Did you even see my video? You'll be tickled to learn that there was one reference to 3959 miles in the 20 videos I, I reviewed, but that was in an optional bonus section. It's only a 17-minute video, so please give it a shot. You might learn something. And again, you're welcome to leave a comment. Curved adjacent. As I mentioned earlier, I had pinned your comment in my conversation with Chemo, where you had asked how I can measure the angle to the sun with a curved adjacent. It's easy to measure the angle to the sun. Don't you remember how I demonstrated it on your 24-hour Equinox live stream? I just used a whole homemade solar clinometer because I couldn't measure anything against a horizon since my window faced a courtyard. The phrase curved adjacent is another one of those nonsense flat earth phrases that just gets repeated endlessly. It satisfies the more informal definition of a non sequitur, describing an absurdity or a phrase used to add humor. The word adjacent has some very specific meanings in geometry. When referring to pairs of items, you could have adjacent angles, adjacent sides, adjacent faces. But when referring to one item, the word adjacent is a very specific leg of a right triangle, the one between the angle in question and the 90 degree angle. Being that it's a right triangle, there is no such thing as a curved adjacent that was literally made up for, by a flat earth fellow. This is not a triangle. Although it has a right angle, this is not a right triangle. Being that it's not a right triangle, this side cannot under any circumstances be called the adjacent, period. I know that you have special disdain for teachers who argue on behalf of the globe, but what you might not realize is that we just might know our subject matter better than you. I've taught many years of high school geometry, and yes, for you purists out there, I did require my students to master geometric proofs, a topic hated by many students. So the fact that you're even using the phrase curved adjacent means that you have no idea what you're talking about. Sorry for being so blunt, Nathan, but that's the truth. Now let's move on to the angle part of the phrase, how can you measure an angle with a curved adjacent? Technically, a curved adjacent doesn't exist. You may, you may as well try to measure the weight of a bucket of unicorn poop. But you may think I'm splitting hairs, focusing on the adjacent. So for a moment, let's take it out and see if we can measure an angle with a curve. Both Blue Marble Science and Science It Out have videos on the topic. So I'll just give the spoiler alert Yes, you can measure an angle to a curve. The one video goes to the definition, simply measuring the angle to the tangent of that curve, while the other video zooms out from this pair of straight-looking lines using GeoGebra. And when you get far enough away, you see that the initial image only looked like two straight lines, but they're clearly curved. Not only curved, but they're actually two circles and the angle between them can be measured just fine. Getting back to curved adjacent, it does remind me of a joke I'd put on the board when starting the school year in geometry. I would draw two angles like this and ask, which angle is bigger, A or B? The kids would get it instantly, of course, the joke being that bigger, in most cases, refers to the amount of space something occupies. But in the case of angles, it only refers to the degree of opening, like a hinge. Which hinge is bigger is a very different question than which hinge is open wider. 
How about a practical example of measuring an angle with a curved um, <clears throat> a baseline like this one? I'm pretty sure that what you've been arguing this entire time is based on a diagram just like this. Just like my chalkboard example, we don't care what the extended sides of the angle are doing. In this case, one of them is a giant curve. It doesn't matter. All we need to do is zoom into the vertex and take our measurement. Let's reorient this angle and see what we're really talking about. It turns out to be the angle where a cable meets the tower on the Golden Gate Bridge. Let's zoom in to the top of the tower. The blue semicircle is called a saddle, and four of them hold up the entire suspended mass of the bridge deck and all the cars, trucks, and pedestrians on it. At peak capacity, the suspended mass is 200,000 tons. So we can divide that by four to get one saddle. Our question is, what is the tension in the cable? It turns out to be a function of both suspended mass and the angle theta using this formula. Tension T equals weight supported by the saddle, W, divided by two times the cosine of theta, the angle the cable makes with the tower. Nathan, please tell Quantum Eraser that we could do trig without triangles. But the point is that the angle theta can be measured just fine, even though the cable is curved. On a side note, it may surprise you to learn that if, the, if theta is 60 degrees, this bridge problem becomes a trivial mental math exercise for much of my audience. This brings us to the sextant. In the case of the curved adjacent nonsense, the question seems to confuse the size of the angle with what the curvature of the Earth is doing, or even the curvature of atmospheric refraction. A sextant measures a visible angle, full stop. If you can see two things, and you can line them up in a sextant's telescope, you can measure the visual angle between them. Recent statements by prominent flat earth folks have focused on verticals and horizontals. But if you look carefully at both of these images, neither is present. Your buddy Sleeping Warrior even insists that a sextant uses three lines. No, it just measures an angle, the visual angle between two objects in your field of view. We'll cover two cases, curved adjacent with measuring the angle of elevation in celestial navigation and sighting in on the horizon, which may be a refracted horizon. First is a confusion with celestial navigation via sextant readings. Flat Earth folks insist that it's done with right triangles, when in reality there are none in the procedure at all. We all know that the GP, or geographical position, of a star or heavenly body is at 90 degrees to the surface, and that many introductory diagrams on celestial navigation will draw a right triangle using the observer at one acute angle, and a very local star at the other. Unfortunately, Nathan, you must understand that these diagrams are drawn by people who know the Earth is a globe, intended for sailors who also know it's a globe. Let's take this complicated celestial di navigation diagram showing the globe Earth and light coming in from a distant star, resulting a circle of equal uh, altitude in red. It's much easier to draw a cone to a local star above a flat plane, resulting in the same circle of equal altitude. Unfortunately, this diagram is misinterpreted by flat earth folks, who then try to duplicate this right triangle on a globe with a local star. This clearly breaks the right triangle because it replaces the leg between the observer and the GP with a curved adjacent. What's especially absurd about this is that anyone performing celestial navigation doesn't do it with any right triangles or any planar triangles at all for that matter. My next video is going to be dedicated to the use of a sextant and how it relates to the flat earth globe earth debate, so I'll have much more to say there. Let's try a second possibility for curved adjacent, one which have, may have a little bit more logic to it. If you're sighting between a heavenly body, such as the sun or moon, and the horizon, Technically, your line of sight to the horizon is refracted, since it's going through miles of atmospheric density gradient. So the argument might be that you're measuring an angle, but one side of the angle is not technically pointing at the thing in question, the horizon. This argument would have merit if it were not for the fact that, for centuries, the dip angle tables have, have 
just been based on theory or phony globe math. They're calibration tools based on real-world experience. What's interesting to me, Nathan, is that the sextant is now seen as the globe killer when, number one, flat Earth folks think something is being measured with a right triangle, thus a globe's curved adjacent makes no sense, and number two, flat Earth folks are now quoting from dip angle tables, which are based on eye height. Just a few years ago, the mantra was, the horizon rises to eye level. Back in September 2016, you did a recitation of three proofs of a flat Earth in a video entitled, Flat Earth, 100% Proof. The first was that water was always level, and the third was about gyroscopes. But number two was about the horizon. Here's what you said, and I'm quoting you verbatim. Number two, the horizon always rises to eye level. It doesn't matter how high we send these balloons. Jaron's about to send one up, or Bob is. Jaron just sent one up, I should say. And you've seen the dog cam, etc., etc. No matter how high you go, the horizon will rise with you to eye level. Now, without getting into the nitty-gritty of the details of how your eye works and how lenses work, that is the base level fact. It does. It shouldn't. If we're on a ball, it should fall away from you. That's number two. The horizon always rises with you to eye level. End quote. You can't get much more unequivocal than that. But here's a bit of nostalgia. You can see Isa Mahalski, the late Antonio Subarats, may he rest in peace, Patricia Steer, and David Weiss, who's now offering three Bitcoin for globe earth proof. I left a lengthy comment on your video five years ago, and you replied, starting with, nah, the horizon does rise to eye level. Here's the rest of my comment, Nathan. I find it amusing that five years ago, you agreed that if we lived on a globe, the horizon should fall away with elevation. And now that you've discovered that, yes, in fact, what we Globers were saying all along is the truth, you've just created more justifications to prop up the flat Earth with this silly phrase, curved adjacent. Fascinating. Remember how we talked about Eratosthenes estimated the circumference of the planet Earth? but his method could also be used to figure out the altitude of a local sun above a flat plane? It turns out he was using an inverted version of celestial navigation. You see, on the summer solstice, the sun shines down a well at Syene, making Syene the GP of the sun, also known as the subsolar point. Eratosthenes measured the angle to the sun in downtown Alexandria, not using a sextant or involving the horizon in any way, but against plumb. Using a simple proportion, 1 50th of a circle, or 7.2 degrees, to is to 50 or 500 stadia, as 360 degrees is to the circumference of the Earth. When converted to modern units, this give, gives us the familiar ratio of 60 nautical miles per degree. With celestial navigation, sailors figure out their distance to the GP of a, of a celestial body by simply using that ratio. Eratosthenes knew the distance and measured the angle, thus he was able to calculate the size of the Earth. Today, if you know the size of the Earth and you measure the angle of elevation, you can calculate the distance to the GP. Brilliant. I hope, Nathan, that this little lesson will put to bed the entire you-can't-measure-an-angle-with-a-curved-adjacent nonsense. Targeting Children Okay, we've covered how I don't assume the Earth to be a sphere, and how I haven't used any logical fallacies, and how I don't require R in my explorations, and how I've never lied to you or anyone else. We've even covered how a sextant works just fine, even with a horizon, which may or may not be the actual factual geometric horizon. Nathan, you've repeated those phrases 472 times. Let's conclude with a topic a bit more serious but also involving more of your trademark repetition. Shortly after my conversation with Chemo, I visited the chat stream of your live show, and you started verbally interacting with the messages I was typing in chat. In the middle of this, my four-year-old asked me to make him some chocolate milk, so I posted this message so that you wouldn't think I'd run away. I let your show play in the kitchen on my laptop as Mercury and I prepared his drink. He likes to do the stirring. Here's 92 seconds of audio from your show. Just a liar, Charles. 
I, my toddler I don't needs we... some chocolate milk back soon. Yeah, you run, take care with that toddler. Don't worry about your lies. I'm sure your toddler will grow up to be a liar, like you, Charles. Lying about not needing R when he used it only 24 hours ago on his own stream. I'm sure your toddler will become a liar like you, Charles. Yeah? Go and train him in lies. Good dog. I think what he's saying is he doesn't use R when he takes measurements on this flat plane we dwell up atop. Yeah, that's why I welcomed him to Flat Earth, John, when he said I don't need to use R. And I'm like, no, you don't. None of us do. We're taking angle measurements to the sun like you did with chemo off flat planes. Can't do that with curved adjacent. I've asked him all about it. He's not answered. He's talked about feeding his kid chocolate milk like I need to know. Hasn't explained how he got angles off a curved adjacent. Hasn't explained where he got R. He said he didn't need it. He just lied. And then ran away to deal with his kid. Who will also grow up to be a liar because daddy's a liar. Yeah, you let me know how my balls taste, Charles, while I accurately describe how you are now nurturing your child to be a liar because you are one. A demonstrable liar who claims he doesn't need R when he's using it less than 24 hours prior. What a scummy liar. Yeah, I guess your little blighter will just be that apple that won't be falling far from that lying tree now, won't he? Or she. I then returned to typing in chat. I find it fascinating when you tell John that you know I don't need R in measuring the angle to the sun, yet you accuse me of lying every time I say I do that exact thing. Hmm. I didn't know what blighter meant when you called my son that, so I had to look it up. Going after my kid wasn't a one-off thing either. When you replayed the show on your other Nathan Oakley channel, I happened to encounter you in the chat, and you wrote... Your brat will also be a liar, Charles. Alleles don't fall far from the tree. Seriously, you're suggesting that my children are going to be genetically predisposed towards lying? You continued, Like father, like son, you are a liar and so your kids be, Charles. And you brought them up, they will be liars just like daddy. You didn't restrict yourself to chat messages during the live streams. You even left comments like this. Mercury will be a liar too, just like his dad. And just this week, I found this in my Gmail inbox. Dear Charles the Liar, I hope you get your lying tongue cut out of your lying face. Same goes for your kids, you lying bastard. Okay, I, I get that you think I'm a liar, but uh, you've made that un <laughs> abundantly clear. But just so I understand your email correctly, you feel that my children should also have their tongues cut out? This is why I can't be mad at you, Nathan. It's obvious that you're attacking my kids because you want to get an emotional response from me. But the emotion I feel is pity. What kind of personal trauma must you have gone through to get you to a place where you feel t attacking another man's children is okay? I teach some wonderful high school students in the great city of Philadelphia. And there, here are some of my last year's graduating seniors on an outing on the Delaware River. I love my students, but sometimes they could be a handful. Instead of getting mad at misbehaving kids, I just remember a clever little phrase. Hurt people hurt people. I never know exactly what may be going on in a student's life that may cause him or her to lash out, but it almost always is personal trauma. Nathan, you have a, have a beautiful and growing family. Your wife and daughters need you. They need you to be the best man you could possibly be. Please, for their sake, get some help. Talk to someone, anyone, about the rage that you're feeling when you interact with folks who know that the Earth is a globe. Stress is a significant killer of folks over 40. Ask what it means when you continually accuse others of being liars, a strong trait of narcissism. Ask about your use of repetitive phrases with no desire for understanding. There's no shame in reaching out for professional help. And lastly, I, re I strongly recommend that you give yourself a little self-care in the form of a gratitude journal. Truly grateful people find it difficult to get angry at others. I will continue talking and debating with Flat Earth folks with love and patience, and I will encourage others to do, this, to do the same. Nathan, your behavior reminds me of a quote by Dr. Philip Friedman. Every interpersonal communication is either a message of love or a call for love. I hope we can speak again sometime in the future with mutual respect and civility. I won't give up on you, Nathan. Sincerely, your friend, 
Charles Breeling. If you or someone you love needs some counseling or mental health resources, please consider BetterHealth.com. It's confidential, and you can get the assistance you need from trained professionals around the globe. Special thanks to my channel supporters. I truly appreciate your generosity. As always, in my comment sections, please treat each other with love and kindness. If you'd like to give the YouTube algorithm a boost, please click the like, share, and subscribe buttons. And remember what Stephen Covey has said, seek first to understand, then to be understood. Bye.